Well, I'm Gretchen Rubin, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have been the biggest fan of Chris's work for years, and I've been wanting to come to World Domination Summit from the first time that I heard that he was putting it together. So I'm so thrilled to be here this weekend. Now, I read and write and think about the subject of happiness. And from time to time, someone sidles over, me, over to me and whispers, Gretchen, what is the secret to happiness? Like, they're going to trick me into revealing the secret of the universe. And actually, I think there's a couple of different good ways to answer that question, depending on what framework you use to think about happiness. You might answer relationships. Relationships are the key to happiness. But another answer to that question is self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is the key to happiness. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, self-knowledge. And I'm going to pose some questions to you to help you get a better insight into yourself. Now, you might think, what's so challenging about self-knowledge? I mean, what do I do all day except just hang out with myself? Um, <laughs> what could be more obvious? But the fact is, it's very easy to lose track of what's true about ourselves. We get so distracted by thinking about the way we wish we were, or the way we think we ought to be, or what other people think we ought to be, that we lose track of what's really true about ourselves. And it's also true that there is a sadness to self-knowledge. Because when we acknowledge the truth of who we really are, we have to also acknowledge the truth of who we are not and who we will never be. So for instance, travel. Travel and adventure. This crowd, more than most, right, loves travel and adventure. Yeah, OK. That's not how I feel. I mean. I don't really like to travel. I mean, OK, sometimes I like to travel for a few days under very specific conditions. Um, but I don't like to travel much. And I don't like adventure. I'm a very unadventurous person. I eat the same food every day. I rarely leave my neighborhood. I do the same few things all the time. And it makes me sad to see this limitation of myself. Because I understand the appeal of travel. I see that it's novelty and, and, and challenge, and new cultures, and new foods, and new people. I, I don't like to travel. <laughs> music. I see how much other people love music. I see why they love it, and they get so much pleasure out of it. And I used to think, if I would just apply myself properly, I could learn to love music, too. I just need to download some more music and read some books and take a class and go to some concerts and learn to play a musical instrument. And then I thought, ah, no. I mean, I like a song here and there, but I am just not that into music. And it makes me sad. But what I found is when I let go of my fantasy of the music-loving, travel-loving Gretchen, I have more time and energy for the things that I really love. Now, as part of my happiness projects, I, ha I developed 12 personal commandments. And these aren't uh, resolutions like make my bed and embrace good smells. These are really <laughs> overarching, which, which are my resolutions. These are more overarching principles that are meant to guide my life, the way that I think and the way that I act. And the first personal commandment and the most important personal commandment is to be Gretchen. And everyone should feel free to substitute their own names. Um, <laughs> but what I found is the more that I brought my life into a reflection of my own nature, my own interests, and my own values, the happier I became. And when I started out to be Gretchen, I was trying to figure out what I could do to do a better job at Gretchen. And it turns out that one of the things that just happens to be true about Gretchen is that I had this crazy passion for children's literature. Children's literature and young adult literature, I read it as a child, and I read it now as an adult. But for a long time as an adult, I didn't really admit this to other people and not even really to myself. I mean, I remember when a couple of the Harry Potter books came out, I don't think I got a copy for a couple months, which is just crazy. I was so in denial about what was really true for me. I had this idea of the way I thought I should be, 
And I, you know, I was very adult and I had very refined taste and I was very discerning and sophisticated. And my love for children's literature didn't fit into that idea of myself that I wanted to project. But as part of this effort to be Gretchen, I realized, you know, I don't have so many passions and interests, especially things that I can do at home, um, that I can afford to sweep them under the rug. And I really decided to shine a spotlight on this love for children's literature. So I made a place for it. I made a shrine to children's literature in my apartment. Um, I, I spent a lot more time reading these books. And I started not one, not two, but three reading groups with other adults who love children's literature. <laughs> now, I thought I was the only adult who read children's literature, but what I found is that when I was willing to step forward and admit the truth about myself and what I really liked, then I was able to connect more meaningfully with people who shared my values, and that gave me a tremendous amount of happiness. So now we're going to turn to some questions for you. Now, all of you in your swag bag got this cunning little notebook. So you can write in your notebook or on any piece of paper that you have. Get out something to write with and read with. And don't worry, this is not going to be extensive answers. It's just notes to yourself to, to jot down the answers to these questions. It's very hard to know ourselves. We so often don't even want to admit what's true. We don't want to look in the mirror. And so sometimes it's helpful to ask questions that get at aspects of your nature indirectly. And that's what these questions are meant to do. And we are going to begin in a very dodgy area. And that is the area of negative emotion. Now, as someone who writes about happiness, People often act as if I'm telling them that the way to have a happy life is to experience no negative emotions, that we should all try to be 10 on the 1 to 10 scale 24-7. Now, this is not realistic, and I don't even think it would be a good life. Negative emotions have a very important role to play in happiness because they are big, flashing warning signs that something needs to change. <laughs> Things like anger, guilt, boredom, resentment are all very, very helpful. They're unpleasant, but they're helpful. So the first question I'm going to ask you, <laughs> this is, I hate this emotion, envy. Write down, whom do you envy and why? And more than one, if you can think of it. <laughs> think about the people you envy and why. Envy is such an unpleasant emotion that often we don't even allow ourselves to acknowledge that we're feeling envious towards a person. We pretend like we're feeling something else. But in fact, envy is super, super helpful. Because when someone has something that you want, that's a very, very useful piece of information for you. Now, I, this was a very important clue for me. I started out my career as a, as a lawyer, and um, I was actually clerking for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor when I realized that I actually wanted to be a writer. And when I look back on my life, I think I always wanted to be a writer. I did so many things to prepare myself to be a writer, but I wasn't willing to acknowledge it to myself for a long time. But it was getting to the point where I was really beginning to grapple with it, and then a very important thing happened. I was reading my alumni notes in my college magazine, you know, those magazines you get with what everybody's doing, and I noticed that when I read about people who had cool law jobs, I felt a kind of mild interest. When I read about people who had cool writing jobs, I felt sick <laughs> with envy. And that told me something about myself that I hadn't been willing to admit. They had what I wanted. Next question. Lying. What do you lie about? Think to yourself, what are some examples when you've caught yourself lying about how much you're doing something or not doing something, how much time you're spending on something or not doing on something? 
we should always pay very special attention to anything we try to hide. So for instance, a friend of mine said, well, I finally did something about how much TV my kids were watching. Because I went to the pediatrician and my pediatrician said to me, how much TV are your kids watching? And she said, I lied through my teeth. <laughs> and she realized it's because there was a disconnect between her behavior and her values. That lie showed her that there was a way which her life was not reflecting the what she wanted it to be. Another friend of mine moved and was much closer to his work. And he said, people kept saying, like, hey, dude, are you walking to work? And he'd be like, yes, it's awesome. Um, but he wasn't actually walking. He'd only walk to work like one or once or twice. So he said, you know, I realized I had to start telling the truth. You know, I had to either start actually walking to work or admitting to the fact that I was not walking to work. But I just couldn't keep lying about it. Next question for you. And this has to do with a kind of ennui that certain people feel. It is a sad fact about happiness that when you say to adults, what do you do for fun? If you suddenly had a free afternoon, what would you choose to do? Many adults are truly mystified. They have no idea what they would do for fun. They spend so much time doing what they have to do or what's fun for the whole family, if such a thing exists, um, <laughs> that, that they've completely lost track of what's actually fun for them. And this is a very important thing to know, both about your work life and your leisure life. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do? So here's a helpful question for you to think about, about fun for yourself. What did you do for fun when you were 10 years old? Write it down. What did you do for fun when you were 10 years old? More than one thing, if you can think of it. It turns out that for most people, what they enjoy doing as an adult, whether for leisure or for work, is very much related to the kind of thing that they enjoyed doing when they were 10 years old. If you liked walking in the woods with your dog, or shooting hoops, or making things with your hands, or performing in front of an audience, that's probably the kind of thing you would enjoy doing as an adult. So I have a friend who said to me, I played with my three dollhouses way past the point of social acceptability. <laughs> and what does she do now? She's an interior decorator. My own sister said to me, I just wish I'd watched more television as a child. Because what does she do now? She's a television writer. When I was 10 years old, I spent countless hours making what I called my blank books. So I got these blank books, and I would spend hours copying passages from my favorite books on one page, and then I would accompany it with uh, images that I had cut out of magazines, beautiful pictures that I would match to the uh, quotation, which is exactly what I do now with my daily moment of happiness email. I pick a favorite happiness quotation from the thousands that I have collected, and I match it with a beautiful image. I'm doing exactly the same thing that I loved as a 10-year-old, and I'm enjoying it in the same way, but it's adapted to a context, and to an adult context. Now, this is a little bit of a different question. It turns out that when you talk to people about the things that make them unhappy, something that makes them unhappy often is trying to resist temptation. This is something that comes up a lot. People are trying to resist temptation, especially eating temptation or drinking temptation. And it drags them down, it drives them crazy. But it turns out that if you know yourself and your own nature, you're much better prepared to handle temptation. So here are two questions aimed at helping you understand your own nature and how to organize things better when it comes to fighting temptation. So, just imagine in your mind whatever it is is, that is your trigger food, you know, whether it's potato chips or french fries or chocolate or M&Ms or Swedish fish, whatever it might be. Whatever, whatever is the thing that tempts you. 
So here's the first question, and you're going to answer either A or B. So A, I walk up to you and just uh, for the sake of argument, I hand you something that you find very tempting, a bar of very, very fine chocolate made in Portland. OK. So I hand you this bar of chocolate, and you eat one square. And then you put the chocolate bar down on the counter. What happens for the rest of the day? A, you're thinking about that chocolate bar all day long. Now, later, I deserve it. I earned it. It's my birthday. I need a treat. Um, <laughs> Got to have it. Um, or, that's A. Or B, I like that. That was great. Maybe I'll have some more later. Maybe tomorrow. Whatever. B. OK, next question. I hand you a hot fudge sundae, and you eat the first bite, and it is delicious. OK, A or B? A, you eat the first bite. It is so delicious. And you keep eating, and it is so delicious. And that tenth bite is just as good as the first bite. And that last bite is just as important as the first bite. Maybe more important, you get to that last bite, maybe you're ready for seconds. Love it. All the way through. A. B. The first bite was amazing. Ah, fifth bite, not so great. Mouth's getting cold. It's, maybe it's too sweet. Tenth bite, you're losing interest. Maybe you don't even finish it. B. OK. This has to do with the difference between abstainers, the A's, and moderators, the B's. And I recognized this, this difference in human nature when I was reading Samuel Johnson. Now, Samuel Johnson was offered wine, and he declined, saying, abstinence is as easy to me as temperance would be difficult. Meaning, I can give it up cold turkey, but I can't have just one. When I read that, I thought, that's me. I'm like Samuel Johnson. I can have none. I can say no. But I can't stop with just one. And that's the thing. Abstainers do very well when they just have none. It's not in the house. They, they don't take even one French fry. Then they forget about it. But once they start, they're going to have a lot of trouble stopping. Moderators, on the other hand, feel trapped and rebellious if they're told that they can't have it. They need to know they can have it sometimes. They need to know that they can have a little bit. They need to know that they can have it when they want it. So they got a box of cookies up in the cabinet. It's getting stale and crumbly. So the moderator just wants to know it's there. The abstainer, it's lucky if it's there by the next day. <laughs> so raise your hand. How many people are abstainers? All right. OK. That's, that's my team. How many people are moderators? There you go. Now, see, the thing is, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong way to approach. It's whatever works for you. But once you know your own nature, you're much better able to organize things um, to suit yourself. And the thing about it is, is abstainers and moderators are always trying to convince each other that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> As an abstainer, I want to say to the moderators, why do you keep breaking your own rules? Why don't you just go cold turkey? Why don't you just get it out of the house? And moderators say things to me like, you're too rigid. You need to learn to enjoy yourself. It's not healthy not to be able to eat one brownie. But it's not a question of right or wrong. It's just a question of whatever works for us and for our own nature. And when we know ourselves, we can set up circumstances in ways that will allow us to succeed. Now we're going to turn to a different way of looking at human nature, at ourselves. Leave behind the unpleasant world of negative emotions and now come into a different realm, the realm of expectation. Now, this is a framework that I've developed as part of my next book, the research for my next book, which is all about habits, which turns out to be like the most fascinating subject of all time. Um, I'm obsessed with habits. And I'm obsessed with why is it that some people can do, do it and some people can't? And what are the circumstances in which people succeed? And, and like, what's going on with habits? And the more I looked at it, the more it became clear to me that we're not alike. And that, in fact, we fall, most of us, into one of four categories. And I call these the four Rubin tendencies because I couldn't think of a better name. If you feel free to email me or put it on Twitter if you think of a better name. Now, and these are very helpful when you're trying to know yourself. Because 
If you understand your nature with, in this respect, you're much better able to set up circumstances that are going to allow you to succeed. And if you understand other people better, you're also able to create circumstances that are going to allow them to succeed. So this has to do with expectations. Now, when you are trying to change a habit, you're trying to impose an expectation on yourself. And people respond to this idea very, very differently, depending on their category. There are two kinds of expectations. Outer expectations, which are things like a work deadline or a request from a sweetheart. And then there are inner expectations, your own desire to keep a resolution, your own desire to practice meditation, outer expectations and inner expectations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the four categories just to define them. Then I'm going to go through and ask you to raise your hands, because I think it'll be really interesting to see what categories the people here fall into. Then finally, and this will be my last point, is I will go through the categories and explain the, the implications of being in a different category. What are the pros, what are the cons of these different categories? But before I start, let me give you a word of warning. Whenever I talk about the four tendencies, I get the distinct impression that some people are on the lookout for which is the best category, or which is the category that they ought to belong to, and then they shoehorn themselves into that category. The fact is, like anything having to do with self-knowledge, this is only going to be a useful exercise if you are honest with yourself. Each of these categories includes people who have been gigantic successes, and each of them includes people who have been big, big failures. So, it's not a question of which is the best category or the right category. It's only a question of understanding yourself and what's true for you and how you can think about yourself and your context so that you can succeed. So outer expectations and inner expectations. Here we go. First category, upholders. Upholders respond readily to outer expectations and inner expectations alike. They keep a deadline, they keep a resolution without much fuss. Next, questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They must be persuaded that something makes sense. But if they're persuaded, they'll keep it. They'll meet that expectation. Next, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer expectations and inner expectations. They resist control, even self-control. A rebel wants to do what a rebel wants to do, and they, they're not going to do any other expectation than that. Finally, obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations but they have a lot of trouble imposing inner expectations on themselves. So for instance, a friend of mine told me, ah, you know, I was on the track team in high school and I never missed a track practice, but I cannot make myself go running on the weekends. That's an obliger. Okay, now to complicate things slightly, I will add this note. Questioners come in very different flavors. It's like, you know, astrology where it's like Leo rising. Um, questioners, often have a default tendency. They will default to upholding or default to rebelling. So they question, but some of them are like, eh, yeah, they're pretty easy to persuade to go along with it. And others are like, no, no, no. I mean, they can be convinced, but you're going to have to work on it because they do not, th their inclination is not to go along with what you say. So, first, ca oh, and, and, and at the end, I'm going to ask you if, if, if you if you felt like you did not find yourself in the categories, which is an interesting question, too. Okay. First, upholders. This is my team, team upholder. All right, okay. Upholders. Okay, next, questioners. What, rebel, rebel and upholders alike. My husband actually is a questioner with upholder tendencies, which is a good match for an upholder. Um, next, rebels. Next, obligers. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, oh, and how many people feel like they did not find themselves within this framework? 
It's pretty good. I mean, no framework is perfect. That's we got we got most of most everybody it looks like. Okay. So interesting. This this is very interesting because this audience more or less bore out what I'm seeing. Um, as I as I this is totally unscientific, by the way. I'm just making this stuff up. But um, <laughs> Purely anecdotally, I will say this, rebel is the smallest category. But what was surprising to me as an upholder is upholder is a very small category too. Not as small as rebel, but pretty small. And that's what, that's what we saw in this audience. And then, but there were more rebels here than usually. I, I spoke at uh, Goldman Sachs and there was not one rebel in the room. <laughs> um, but, um, and then I can't really tell if questioners is bigger or obligers is bigger, but those are two very large categories. A lot of people fit into obligers and, and, and questioners. So those are, those are by far the, the dominant ones. Um, so how do, you, how do you think about this? Okay, so this is a little bit of information about yourself. What, what, what difference does it make? How can, you, how can you act on it? How can you learn something about yourself that's gonna change the way you live your life in a way that's gonna be helpful to you? And maybe you understand somebody else a little bit better too. Uh, and you can set things up to help with that person. So the thing about upholders, so start there. Now, upholders are very motivated by fulfillment. Both the idea of fuf like fulfilling an order and also fulfillment, the fulfilling the feeling that they get when they get something done. They wake up in the morning and they think, what's on the to-do list today? What's on the schedule for today? They're very focused on knowing what's expected of them. They hate to be blamed for things, to make mistakes, to get things wrong, to let people down. They really want to know what the rules are. And they're great at following the rules. They really, they want to understand them. They're often looking for rules beyond rules, say, in art or aesthetics or ethics, you know, what, what do we not even understand our rules? Um, and they're, they're always uh, very focused on that. And they're also very good at self-starting. They don't need a lot of supervision or accountability. Um, if they make up their mind to do something, they do it. So in a lot of ways, they have, it's great. But there's a dark side to being an upholder too, um, as I well know. An upholder wants to know what's expected of them, and they can become paralyzed and overwhelmed if they feel like the rules aren't clear or they don't know what's expected of them or if things are ambiguous. They will often say things like, I wish I didn't want those gold stars so much, or I wish it didn't matter to me so much what other people want. Um, they, they sometimes find it hard to question enough what they should be doing because that urge to like just cross something off the list or get something done or meet an expectation can be very strong and it's so satisfying for them. And there, I can say it because it's my category, there's kind of a relentlessness, there's a grindingness to upholders. They're going to do it, they're going to do it, they expect you to do it and, and it, it's kind of relentless. Next, questioners. So questioners wake up in the morning and they think, what needs to get done today? They're very motivated by logic and sound reasons. They want to know why they're supposed to do something. Now, this can be very, very helpful, both for organizations and for in relationships, because the questioner is the one who's saying, why are we doing this at all? Is this the right way to be doing this? Like, what, what are we doing? What, what, you know, let's, let's, let's ask ourselves that. And that can be very helpful. They usually love information. They love research. They want to gather. They want to learn. And if they accept an expectation, they're very good about fulfilling it because they've, in a way, they make every expectation an inner expectation because they endorse everything themselves. So they'll take that on and run with it. But their upside is their downside, just like with the upholders. And the thing about questioners is if they don't think you should have to do it, they're not going to do it. You said you wanted the report by Friday. They think you don't want it till, you don't need it till Wednesday. So you know what? They're going to give it to you Wednesday. <laughs> um, I had somebody write to me on my blog and said, um, I got a ticket for parking on the wrong side of the street, and I'm not convinced that this improves vehicular safety, so I'm not paying. <laughs> it's like... Good luck with that. <laughs> um, and questioners themselves can, will say that they become exhausted 
with the process of questioning. That they say, you know, sometimes I just want to let it go, or I, I, I want to stop researching, or I, you know, I just, I know that I just, it's gonna, we're gonna do it this way, so like, I just need to like, let it go. And they can't, because there's always the why, why, why. And people in relationships with questioners sometimes often find it tiresome. Um, <laughs> I think I hear some notes of recognition. Um, and also, um, questioners, because it is so important for them to know why to do things, they can sometimes become paralyzed if they feel like they don't have enough information. They want perfect information, which sometimes just isn't something that's realistic. And so it's very uncomfortable for them to act if they feel like they, they, they don't have sound enough reasons for making a certain judgment. Another thing, questioners, they hate anything arbitrary. It's very funny. One sign of a questioner is if you say, do you keep a New Year's resolution? They'll say, no. because if it's important to me, I'll do it right away. Why would I wait for the new year? That's totally arbitrary. This is like every questioner makes this remark. <laughs> Next, the rebels. Now, there are, there's great things about rebels. I mean, talk about thinking outside the box. They're thinking outside the box. They, because one of the aspects of being a rebel is not only do they resist expectations, they actually often will actively go contrary to an expectation. So if you ask them to do something or tell them to do something, not only does that not make them think that they should do it, it might actually in ignite in them a desire to do exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, somebody was telling me that, uh, that with her, her girlfriend was such a rebel that if you said to her, oh, read this book, you're going to love it, she would say, I'm not going to read it. I hate it. <laughs> so, so the rebel, the rebel is very free and very unbounded in, and, can, and can go outside that box in ways that can be very, very helpful and very free and exciting and fun to be around. But it can be frustrating because when you want somebody to do something, either because you want them to do it or you want to tell them to do it, it can be frustrating if they just won't do it. Now, rebels do often respond to certain kinds of arguments. For instance, not to say that you would manipulate them, but this is the kind of thing that often works. Um, I'll show you. Very, very compelling to a rebel. I don't think your team can get that report done by Friday. I'll show you. Um, I know a rebel who basically rebelled her way into an Ivy League college because it was just like somebody, you know, randomly in like ninth grade was like, there's no way you're going to get in. It's like, ha ha, you watch. Um, and also, Rebels will choose to do something out of love for you. They do it because there's an emotional reason to do it. They're not doing it because you asked them to do it. They're not doing it because you told them to do it. But they will choose to do it out of love for you. Rebels want to do what they want to do. So they are very tied to a sense of like, present authenticity. They know what they want to do, which some of the other tendencies have a lot of trouble understanding. So that's very positive. But it can become stifling when they can't get themselves to do something that they don't want to do. They want to do something they don't want to do. And they, this is a paradox. And they will say this. They feel stifled sometimes by their own nature. Um, I met at South by Southwest a couple of years ago. I talked to a guy who had his own tech company um, and was clearly a rebel. I mean, he was saying, you know, I have to work for myself. I have to do what I want. I can't take orders from anybody else. I want to wake up in the morning and, you know, do the things that I want to do. And I said, you know, I completely get it, but I work for myself. And all of us have things that we have to do that we don't want to do just because you know, it, these, they're just these parts of what you have to do. How do you handle that? And he said, it's crippling. He said, I know my business could be much more successful, except that I really am not able to make myself do things that I don't want to do in, unless it's really, really down to the wire, and I have to do it. So these are the pros and the cons of the rebel. Finally, obligers. Now, an obliger wakes up in the morning and thinks, what do I have to do today? What's expected of me today? They are very motivated by external accountability. And this is the key thing to understand for obligers. For an obliger, it is all about the structure of external accountability. 
Now, obligers are fantastic to have around. They make great team members, great family members, great friends, because they're going to come through for you. They hate to let people down. They, they hate to make mistakes. They want, they want to do what, what's expected of them. But obligers bear the brunt of it on themselves. And they'll say that. They'll say things like, I don't like being a people pleaser. I don't like feeling like I can do for everybody else, but I can never do for my, what I, what's important to me. And they get very frustrated with themselves. But fortunately, there's like a very easy fix, which is an obliger needs to make sure to build in external accountability for anything that the obliger wants to do for himself or herself. So for instance, a friend of mine was, told me, Oh, for like 10 years, I wanted to take piano lessons. I never did. But finally, my children got old enough to take piano lessons. And so I arranged for us all to take piano lessons together. And now I have to practice because my children, would, they know if I, want, if I don't. Um, so there was a kind of external accountability there. Um, another friend of mine said, well, I've been wanting to take yoga forever. Finally, I signed up for a yoga class. I went one time. It was the $700 yoga class. Um, and the fact is, is if she'd known she was an obliger, she could have said, okay, I need, I need structures of external accountability. Just losing the money isn't enough. For some people, that might have been enough, wasn't enough for her. But I, needed, I need to have an instructor who's going to email me and ask me why I didn't show up. I need to make a plan with a friend who's going to be disappointed if I'm not there. I need to hire a coach. Like, there's all different kinds of external accountability you can build in if you know that's what you need. Um, another thing about obligers, they're not good at self-starting, as you can imagine. So let's say you're an obliger and you have something like a PhD thesis due in five years. That is going to be a big, big challenge to an obliger. Because without deadlines, without accountability, without milestones where people are watching when there's surveillance in a sense that you're being held to uh, account, it's very easy for these things to slip and slip and slip. So they very much need things like deadlines, like coaches, like late fees, like check-ins, anything like this that's going to make sure that they can do for themselves what they do for other people. And they are very susceptible to burnout. If you're an obliger, you need to be aware of that in yourself. And if you work with an obliger, we all take advantage of the obligers. We get it. <laughs> it's going to get done for us. Um, Everybody around an obliger needs to be aware of that and make sure that they help protect the obliger from the obliger's tendency to overcommit and not to take downtime and all this and make sure that we protect them from burnout. Now, one of the things that you see when you think about the tendencies is you can see how certain combinations of people would be more fruitful than others, and how certain people would be more successful in certain positions than others. For instance, I wrote about this on my blog, and a guy wrote in, he goes, well, now I understand why I hate my job. I'm a tax accountant, and I'm a questioner. <laughs> and here's an interesting fact. I have never met a rebel who is married, who is not married to an obliger. I've met obligers who are married to other categories, but I have never met a pair that was not rebel obliger. Interesting. And I know that as an upholder, I don't think I could be married to anybody who wasn't an upholder or, an, or a questioner with upholder tendencies, or maybe an obliger. I don't, but you see, how, <laughs> you see how this works. Or I was talking to a guy who was a professor who was trying to get his students to be better about turning their papers in on time. And his idea was to get rid of the weekly meetings because it was a waste of everybody's time because they weren't making enough progress. And I said, no, 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 probably what you have is a bunch of obligers. The only reason they're making any progress at all is because you're having this meeting. You should be much more adamant about the fact that you're expecting to see a lot of productivity every time they come in so that they have that feeling of accountability and that's what's going to help them succeed. If, but he was, as an upholder, he was like, oh, I'll just let them go work on their own. They'll do better that way. I'm like, yeah, don't kid yourself. <laughs> so with all these things, with all questions of self-knowledge, really, my final point is just that in the end, we can build a happy life only on the foundation of our own nature, our own values, our own interests. And to take the time to understand ourselves is really the biggest adventure of our whole life. Um, which is to understand ourselves, accept ourselves, and to build a life around the, what is true about us. So thank you.